Okay, what is going on everyone? Uh, so in this video, what I wanna do is go through a bunch of topics that were covered in last month's issue of Mass, um, where I'd normally just pick one of those topics and do a complete deep dive on it in just one video. In this video, I wanna do something a little bit different. We're gonna go through the whole issue over here together. I'm gonna share my thoughts on it and let you guys know some of what would be covered in a typical issue of Mass. So because I'm gonna be covering a bunch of different topics, I'll have all the timestamps down below. I'm just gonna go at my own pace here and we're gonna work through uh, this issue together. So what I wanna start with over here is this RPE and RIR complete guide. RPE is something I've talked about a lot here on the channel and it's something that I use in my training programs, but I don't think I've ever done it full justice in a video really describing exactly what it means and how you should apply it. And the same thing goes for RIR. I still get asked what these concepts are all about. Um, so very briefly, just so everybody's on the same page here, RPE stands for Rating of Perceived Exertion. Um, so it's basically a subjective measure of how hard it feels like you're working. And RIR stands for Reps in Reserve. So it's kind of like the inverse of RPE. If you took a set completely to failure, you hit that 10th rep and you can't get another one, that would be zero reps in reserve. If instead you stopped at rep nine, that would mean you had one rep in reserve or one rep left in the tank. So in this article, uh, Dr. Zordos goes through all the different applications of RPE, and you'll see that it's not quite as simple as a lot of people uh, might think. Now, the most common use of RPE is for simple load prescription. Um, so it basically allows you to figure out what weight you should use. So if I told you to do three sets of 10 on a bicep curl at an RPE of eight, that would give you some idea of how heavy the weight needs to be in order to have you in that right effort or exertion zone. And that's how most people use it, but that's far from the only way it can be used. Now, before we dig into the application, I do wanna do a really brief history here because I think it's actually really interesting. Um, so the RPE scale has actually been around since the 1970s, and it originated in endurance sports uh, with aerobic exercise applications. And originally it was set up on a RPE score that ranked from six to 20. Now that might seem totally random, uh, but the reason it was set up like that is because a rating of six would correspond to a heart rate of 60 beats per minute. And a rating of 20 would respond to a heart rate of 200 beats per minute. So that would be like the hardest cardio you could imagine down here. And this would be like very, very light aerobic exercise up here. In the time between then and now, a lot of people have helped develop it for resistance training. Uh, but I think that the way most people use it today in the fitness community uh, can probably be credited to Mike Teixeira, who is a powerlifting coach. And he was kind of the first guy to use reps and reserve descriptors to set up RPE. Um, so just looking at table three down here, this is how it would in fact be set up. So an RPE of 10, like we said, that would be maximal effort. So you couldn't have gotten another rep. Um, RPE nine would mean you've got one rep in the tank. Now, RPE 9.5 is kind of interesting. You'll sometimes hear people say this, and it doesn't mean that, <clears throat> excuse me, it doesn't mean that you could have gotten an extra half a rep. What it really means is you wouldn't have any reps in reserve, but you probably could have done a little bit more weight. So the same reps with a little more weight. And then when you get down in like this eight, seven, six zone, it's a little bit more of a gray area, generally meaning like you got a couple reps left in the tank, maybe two or three reps left in the tank, something like that. Um, so I wanna dig into a few different ways that you can implement RPE. The main point of RPE to begin with is to be used as a form of auto-regulation. So basically what this means is rather than, you know, a coach telling you you need to go in and do three sets of eight on the bench press with 225 pounds, instead he would say, you know, do three sets of eight on the bench press to an RPE of eight. And then you would choose the weight based on how you're feeling that day. So with RPE, on days that you feel good, you have that freedom to go heavier. And on days that you don't feel good, you can go a little bit lighter. And this has been shown in the literature to increase strength gains over time when compared to a more fixed approach. So let's actually just go back to this table real quick um, for context because I know a lot of people uh, in my effective reps video and in some other videos are under the impression that you should just always go to failure. Like you need to train as hard as possible all the time. Um, and then in that case, RPE would kind of be obsolete because you would just always train at an RPE 10. Um, but we know for many reasons, and I've covered this on the channel a lot, 
that because you can get similar hypertrophy, as long as you're in this zone of, let's say, RP7 to RP10, it makes sense in most contexts to be leaving some reps in the tank. If you're going all the way to failure, you're not getting much more hypertrophy, but you're creating a lot more fatigue. And then that imposes more limitations on your ability to recover. Um, so that's kind of the conceptual basis behind it, apart from the, the autoregulation part. Let's look at this table here, table number four. Um, this is an example of what a about a four month training program would look like using RPE. So over here, you'd be training three days per week. So this would only be for say one exercise. So let's say you're really trying to get your bench press up. Uh, you'd hit the bench press on say Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And then this would be the first month or so. This would be the second month, third month, and fourth month. So you can see here in the first month, we're doing quite a lot of volume work. So three sets of 10, four sets of eight, even on the strength day, it's still a really high volume day, five sets of six. Uh, but the RPE is quite low. So only a five to seven RPE for this month. Then in the next month, you can see the volume is a bit lower. So we've slashed about two reps from every set on each training day, but now the RPE is a bit higher. So you're exerting yourself a little bit harder, but the volume has dropped down a bit. In the third month, kind of the same thing. Volume is lower again, the rep count is lower, means the weights are heavier, and you're also pushing yourself a little bit closer to failure. So working at about a seven to nine RPE here. And then in the fourth month, this is what I would call something like uh, a powerlifting peaking block. Uh, basically you can see even on the highest volume day, you're still pretty much doing pure, pure strength work. Uh, and then some triples on the second day, and then you're doing heavy singles at an RPE of 9.5. So a very high exertion level uh, on the third day in this block which is gonna get you very acclimated to lifting very heavy loads. Um, so this would be exa an example of using an auto-regulated model to prescribe load over an entire macro cycle. And it uses basically a simple linear progression or a, a linear periodization scheme where volume is coming down as the intensity and the load is going up. Another interesting thing that they talk about here is how to adjust load if you miss that RPE. So this is something I get asked a lot from my programs. Um, let's say you go in, you're gonna do three sets of eight at an RPE of six to eight, right? So you're leaving two, three, maybe four reps in the tank uh, on every set. So you load some weight up that you expect would have you in that RPE zone, but as it turns out, it's actually way too light. Well, in that case, for your next set, you would want to increase the load uh, based on this table over here. So if your actual RPE was like a four, you'd wanna increase the load by 8%. Now, obviously you don't need to monitor it to that level of specificity unless maybe you're like a competitive power lifter or something. The general idea is that if the RPE was too low, increase the weight for the next set. If it was too high, you decrease the weight uh, for the next set. Uh, according to these metrics over here. And if you were in the right target zone, so if it actually was in the right zone, RPE six to eight, say, uh, then it would be the lifter's choice. So if it was towards, say, the lower end of that range, you might wanna add a little bit of weight. Uh, if it was a little bit high, you might wanna drop it back a bit or just keep the weight the same and see what happens. So that's an interesting table. And that came from a paper from Eric Helms. Okay, so I'm not gonna, gonna go into a lot of detail on this part, uh, basically auto-regulating volume. Um, so a lot of people think of RPE as a way to auto-regulate the load, uh, but you can also use it to auto-regulate volume in a couple interesting ways. The first way is to determine the number of reps that you do in a set. That's one that I've used a bit myself, and we'll talk about that. And the other way is the number of sets in a session for a specific exercise. Um, so we'll look at this really quickly in this table six here. So yeah, the first one is auto-regulating the number of reps in a set. So for this, you would basically choose how many sets you're going to do for a specific exercise. So let's say four sets on squats and you would go with 70% of your one rep max. So let's say that comes out to be, I don't know, three, 315 pounds. You wouldn't have a target rep count. You would simply stop each set once you've hit an RPE of six to eight. So you know the load you're using, you know the exercise you're using, you know the number of sets you're gonna do, and you just leave the reps to be auto-regulated by the RPE. This is actually how Eric Helms trained when I trained with him in Australia. I'll link that video down below. For all of his exercises, as far as I can remember, he didn't actually have a set rep count. So he would never say, oh, I'm gonna do three sets of 10 on this. He would say, I'm gonna do three sets at an RPE eight, which means whether he got to 10 reps or he got to six reps or he got to 14 reps, whatever it may be, he would just stop once he hit that RPE. And this is really nice because a lot of the times people will just hit their target rep count and then stop. And they might not be anywhere near close to failure, 
or they might be killing themselves just to reach that rep count when most often in training programs, the rep count is kind of arbitrary. Like it's meant to just get you in the general ball, ballpark to start working on any given adaptation. So using RPE to auto-regulate it makes perfect sense. The other way that you can use this is uh, auto-regulating -reg the total number of sets. So in this case, you would choose uh, the exercise, you'd choose the amount of weight, and you would know the number of reps, and then you would just keep doing sets until you reached your target RPE for that day. So for example, let's say you do your first set of squats um, and you hit an RPE seven. You're like, yeah, I could have got like three more uh, reps on that set. You do another set, maybe on this set you reach RPE seven and a half or something. Next set, RPE eight. You would cap it once you reach that RPE uh, of eight, assuming that was where you wanted to stop. Um, now, for some people, especially women who can just tolerate a ton of volume, this could probably get carried away. <laughs> um, so you could, I don't know, put some weight on the bar, do 12, 13, 14 sets and still feel like your RPE hasn't hit that upper threshold. Um, so it's probably a good idea to put some kind of cap on the number of sets so that your volume doesn't get out of hand. Um, so generally speaking, you'll probably want a volume cap of like five or six sets for a given exercise. Um, but this is a cool way to auto-regulate volume, and it's something I feel like a lot of people haven't considered in terms of applications of RPE. There's a bunch of other stuff here in the article if you guys would like to uh, check it out if you're subscribed. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on the rest-pause stuff here. There's also uh, ways to track progress and predict your one rep max, different progression schemes you can use with RPE. Uh, you can set up a flexible template based off of your warm-ups using RPE. It's fairly straightforward. And one thing that actually wasn't uh, mentioned in the article that I use in my programs is having the trainee track last set RPE. Um, this was an idea I got from Bryce Lewis uh, years ago from an interview we did. And basically the idea is after you finish your last set, write down what the RPE in fact was for that set. And then the next week you can refer back to it and say, okay, this weight for this much, for this many reps gave me a nine RPE last week. You might do that again the next week, but the last set felt easier. It was only an eight RPE. So that's an indication that your strength has improved and maybe now next week it's time to increase the weight. Um, and that can give you all kinds of useful feedback uh, as a coach and as an athlete. Um, so tracking that last set RPE, I think is a, is a good tool as well. All right, so that is the RPE article. <laughs> it's so much information in there. I thought it was fantastic. Um, up next, I wanna talk about this piece from Greg Knuckles uh, on multi-joint versus single joint exercises uh, for the biceps. This was a study from uh, Maniro and colleagues, and it was another one of those studies that compared multi-joint compound exercises to single joint isolation exercises. Now this type of research in general, I think is trying to figure out if we need to do isolation work or if we just stick to the basic compound stuff, will that be enough to maximize hypertrophy of all the musculature? So. I could see this having application for people who say don't have a lot of time to spend in the gym and they want to find the most efficient training program that's going to give them their best bang for their buck when it comes to size and strength. It would be good to know if you could you know, build your biceps well with just doing rows, just doing pull-ups or pull-downs or what have you, or if you actually need to bother going through the effort of doing curls as well. Um, so that was exactly what this study looked at. They compared doing just dumbbell rows to doing just bicep curls. Um, so the study design, I'm going to just briefly go through this. It was actually really interesting. So they did eight weeks of either biceps curl on its own or dumbbell row on its own. Um, however, it used a within-subject unilateral design. Um, so what this means is each subject acted as their own control by doing only dumbbell curls on one arm and doing only <laughs> dumbbell rows on the other arm. And then they would just measure the differences in biceps hypertrophy between the two arms. And this is a really good study design uh, in exercise science literature because let's say you were to split these 10 subjects up into two different groups, there could be some muscular freak of nature in one of the groups that really drags the group average up for that condition. Um, and it could really skew the results, especially with a low sample size like this. Um, so the within subject design is a, a stronger way to do put a study like this together. So they also actually measured strength here. So let's take a quick look at that here in figure one and two. 
Um, so figure one, this is looking at dumbbell row strength. Nothing too surprising here. Doing the multi-joint compound movements of the row uh, led to more strength increase on the row. Doing a bicep curl didn't really increase strength on the row, as you'd pretty much expect. Similarly, doing bicep curls made you stronger at bicep curls. Doing bicep curls didn't make you stronger at doing rows. That's what you'd expect. Strength is generally very specific. So if you want to get better at the bench press, you need to bench press. <laughs> um, if you want to get uh, a stronger curl, you need to curl. Um, that's, that's the way it tends to work. It's like any skill. You want to get better at it. You should practice it more often, provided you're practicing it with, with good technique. Um, one interesting thing though about the, the strength findings is that there wasn't much of an observed cross-education effect. Um, so this refers to something that's been seen quite a bit in the literature where if you only train one arm or one limb, the other limb will still see a strength benefit up to 40% as large as the trained limb. Um, so maybe in this case, doing dumbbell rows, you'd expect to see about maybe 40% of an increase on the arm that didn't do rows simply due to the cross-education effect. I don't know why that would be not observed in this study, but I thought it was an interesting point here. Okay, so the, 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 the size results uh, in figure three, pretty clear that doing single joint movements led to more biceps hypertrophy than just doing the multi-joint movement. So clearly uh, just doing dumbbell rows wasn't enough to grow the biceps on its own. And I think that this does add to the idea that if you want to maximize biceps hypertrophy, it really is important to isolate the biceps, especially past the beginner level. Now, I think it's worth saying that there was this study from Gentil and colleagues that found that pull downs, so doing lat pull downs, did result in similar biceps hypertrophy to doing biceps curls. Um, so it could be the case that for beginners, the study was done on beginners, pull downs are better at building the biceps than dumbbell rows are, and there could be a few reasons for this. Um, so just in general, when you're looking at whether or not a compound lift is going to carry over well to an assistance muscle, I think that there are a few things you want to consider. Um, the first is, well, the first is range of motion, but we're going to look at uh, whether or not it's likely to limit performance on that exercise. Um, so with the pull down, it seems more likely to me that the biceps could be the limiting factor, especially in beginners. People have a tendency to want to pull with their arms more than with their lats. So it could be the case that people were fatiguing on these pull downs because their biceps were giving out. And then obviously you'd expect to see similar biceps hypertrophy to a group doing biceps curls. Whereas with the dumbbell row, the way the lift is set up biomechanically it's much more likely that the lats will be the limiting factor. So your lats are almost always going to fatigue before your biceps will on a row. So that could be why the, num the dumbbell row isn't as good of a biceps builder as a pull down would be for beginners. Um, another consideration is the range of motion for the exercise. Um, so just looking at another example, uh, would the bench press be a good enough exercise to maximize triceps development? Maybe, but I would say it probably at least depends on your grip width. Um, so if you're gonna go with a very wide grip, the amount of elbow extension range of motion is gonna be very small. Whereas if you go with a closer grip, obviously you're taking your elbow through a much larger range of motion. The triceps are gonna be targeted to a greater degree. Another interesting thing about the triceps is that they're an example of a biarticular muscle, at least the long head of the triceps is. And when it comes to biarticular muscles, they act on two joints. So in the piece, Greg kind of mentions that when it comes to these biarticular muscles, it's a good idea to use isolation or isolation type exercises that target both functions of that muscle. So just going with the triceps, for example, it trains both elbow extension and shoulder extension. So doing some kind of pullover base movement with also tricep extension included would make sense. And this is why if you've seen my Technique Tuesday video, I recommend doing skull crushers with the, the arms more back overhead because you can get that slight bit of pullover shoulder extension action and get the, uh, the long head of the triceps more involved that way. Um, the same thing goes for the hamstrings. They cross both the hip joint and the knee joint. So just doing, um, let's say squats, for example, would be terrible for the hamstrings for reasons I've talked about in other videos. You want to directly train hip extension and knee flexion, which means you want to include a leg curl and some kind of hip hinge 
hip extension based movement like a Romanian deadlift. Um, so those are all the considerations there. As far as the original question for the, this paper, do multi-joint exercises cause as much hypertrophy as single joint exercise? Um, like Greg says here, it may not be that much of a useful question in practice. You'd probably want to combine exercises, especially in these instances. But if you are looking to set up the most efficient routine possible, there are some considerations when it comes to you know, how much of a range of motion is involved, how likely is that exercise to limit performance on that muscle, and is the muscle a biarticular muscle. For the record, the main biarticular muscles that you'd be concerned with from a physique perspective would be the long head of the triceps, the hamstrings, and the rectus femoris of the quadriceps. And that's uh, something I'm gonna talk about in my, my next Technique Tuesday video on training the quads. So you guys can stay tuned for that. All right, what do we got next? <laughs> uh, all right, so next I wanna go through this piece uh, from Eric Helms called The Pop-Tart Problem, Processed Foods and Overeating. So this was a summary of a really cool paper uh, from Kevin Hall's group, looking at the difference between processed foods uh, and non-processed foods, or minimally processed foods. Um, so I'm not gonna go through this whole thing in that much detail. There's so much to this study, uh, I would need at least one full video. Um, so I'm just gonna go through the main takeaways here. Basically in a metabolic ward, uh, which makes the study very controlled, 20 adults were presented with diets consisting of either unprocessed or ultra processed foods. And those foods were matched for calories, sugar, fat, uh, macronutrients, and fiber uh, for two weeks. And the participants were told they could they could consume as much as they wanted of each diet. Um, so basically, the diets were very similar, except for the fact that one was processed and one wasn't. And if the subjects just so chose to eat everything that was put in front of them, they would have eaten about 3,900 or about 4,000 calories uh, in both groups. So the subjects were basically told they could just stop eating whenever they felt like stopping eating, basically. But if they all if they, all the subjects ate everything, they would have eaten about 4,000 calories. So basically what the study found was that the subjects eating the processed food diet ended up eating about 500 calories more per day, which is really significant. And the reason for this, pretty straightforward, uh, processed foods uh, are consumed in excess because they're eaten faster, they suppress appetite less, and they require more energy be consumed to achieve a similar amount of protein intake uh, as compared to unprocessed foods. So the protein intake thing is probably a really big factor of this. Later in the article, Eric talks about uh, protein leverage theory, which is pretty much the idea that in order to feel fully satiated or to sufficiently blunt your hunger after a given meal, you need to reach a certain threshold of protein. And because very highly processed foods tend to be lower in protein per calorie, you have to eat more calories of them in order to reach that protein threshold. Now, I think that this study has its, most of its application in the discussion between people who are flexible dieters who really, you know, track their macros and argue that as long as you hit the macros, it doesn't really matter where the macros are coming from or what foods you eat. Um, whereas on the other side, you have people saying, well, you have to eat clean in order to, to lose weight. And I think that the truth <laughs> isn't really found on either extreme in this case. And I think that where it's useful is in the reality that tracking should be a temporary thing, like unless you have a specific goal that you're you're shooting for, whether that be you know a, a competition or a photo shoot, vacation, fat loss for summer, what, whatever the case may be, most people won't be tracking forever. Um, he says in the piece, 99% of people aren't going to track macros for the rest of their lives. So, knowing that a unprocessed diet makes fat loss so much easier, as it allows you to eat fewer calories, can be a good guiding tool for people who aren't tracking, obviously. Um, now, where that advice that as long as you hit the macros, uh, you'll achieve good fat loss could have merit would be if you're talking to someone who is actually afraid of processed foods. Um, in that case, you know, you could let that person know if they have a Snickers bar occasionally, it's not going to derail their process. They're still going to be healthy. Everything will be perfectly fine. Um, but outside of that context, it's not really all that useful, especially if you plan to get away from tracking every macro very specifically. Um, so kind of to conclude, Eric said, uh, the good news is that unprocessed diets rock. They result in effortless fat loss. 
Eating a whole food diet for the average person is gonna result in higher levels of satiety, less hunger, and a lower energy intake, leading to more fat loss. And if you aren't sure what that kind of diet looks like, uh, you just wanna think lots of fruits, vegetables, lean proteins, and in general, a diet dominated by single ingredient foods. Um, so this was a cool paper. I thought that was, that was really interesting. Um, after that, we're going to quickly go through this piece on alcohol from Eric Trexler. So Eric was recently, this is not Eric Helms, this is a different Eric. Uh, he was recently added to the mass panel, um, and I, I've been enjoying his write-ups as well. Um, he had this beautiful quote here, uh, the thought of choosing between gains and alcohol is a troubling dilemma. <laughs> um, so he sought to answer uh, that question in this piece. So basically... I did another video on alcohol consumption and how it affects uh, gains and, and everything uh, related to it. Um, so I'll link that down below. I'm gonna go through this really quickly. What I found surprising here was that there wasn't, you know, in this study, which was a, a meta analysis or a, a systematic review, uh, they found no meaningful effect on pretty heavy alcohol consumption. So about eight standard drinks for an 80 kilogram person uh, when it comes to recovery from resistance exercise. Um, but when I looked into this deeper, it seemed like the recovery measures to me were not necessarily how we might always think of recovery from a training perspective. Um, like they measured uh, isokinetic strength levels. They looked at creatine kinase levels, which is a marker uh, of muscle damage and counter movement jump performance, kind of these athletic measures that may not necessarily translate to the way bodybuilders would train. Um, I can speak from my personal and coaching experience that if I have a heavy drinking episode, like eight standard drinks, I'm dehydrated the next day, I'm lethargic, my sleep was terrible, and my performance is inevitably worse to the point that I usually recommend just taking the day off, rehydrating, filling glycogen back up, and then getting back to training the next day. Um, so I think the context matters, and I believe it was found that the impact on recovery did depend on how much you actually drank, which you'd expect. And there was also a sex-specific effect. Um, so heavy drinking seems to affect men much worse than it does women, and that's true both of recovery and of its effect on muscle protein synthesis. Um, so I covered in that other video that alcohol consumption does blunt muscle protein synthesis, and it does so to the point that even consuming extra protein isn't able to fully rescue that decrease in muscle protein synthesis. So even if you eat protein along with the alcohol, um, it, it's not able to rescue that decrease in, in MPS. However, that effect is much more prominent in men than in women, and that's probably because estrogen seems to have some kind of protective effect on those mechanisms and on recovery. Um, so th that is a, an interesting caveat there. Women can probably get wasted and perform better and not have their muscle gains inhibited as much as, as men would. Um, but all in all, despite that interesting finding on recovery, um, Heavy alcohol intake is still really bad for <laughs> pretty much everything we'd care about as people concerned with uh, physique and strength. Um, it has unfavorable effects on protein synthesis. It really negatively impacts sleep quality. I think this is a really big one because a lot of people will notice that they may fall asleep faster when they're drunk, um, but this, the actual quality and the duration of the sleep is significantly worse, and so that's actually really bad for recovery. Um, it's also been shown to, at least in one study, increase testosterone acutely for over a very short time frame, but over a longer time scale and at heavier doses, it really decreases testosterone, which is probably bad for anabolism. So in general, consistent intake of high doses of alcohol is a bad move for those who want to optimize health, body composition, or performance. So I definitely recommend using alcohol in moderation. Now, by the same token, having the occasional drink, glass of wine, bottle of beer isn't going to derail your progress in any way. Uh, I think that that's fine. And if you are someone who tracks macros, you can fit it into your macros. The thing is, is the more inebriated you get, the more your inhibitions tend to be lowered and so you're more likely to go on some kind of binge and then other research has found that that usually isn't compensated for later so when you drink go out and have a binge you usually don't make up for it by eating less the next day so that's just usually ends up being stored as fat or glycogen in the best case so um alcohol alcohol is bad uh, when it comes to to body composition for the most part and you should definitely uh use it in moderation all right if you guys have stuck around this long, I'm impressed. <laughs> it's the first time I've done a video like this, uh, so let me know what you think. Um, 
I could have easily split this up into like six different videos, but I thought it would be cool to kind of just like go through one issue with you guys. Um, okay, next piece has to do with the whole muscle confusion phenomenon. Um, so a lot of people, especially bodybuilders, seem to be under the impression that you need to constantly be switching things up in the gym in order to make continued progress. Arnold really talked about this, and a lot of bodybuilders over the years have made a big deal out of muscle confusion. Like You need to keep your muscle always guessing in order to force it to respond and adapt and grow. And it does make intuitive sense, uh, but there's just no backing for it whatsoever in the literature, at least on a short-term time scale. So what this study did, basically they used the same unilateral uh, uh, design, uh, the within subject unilateral design as the uh, second piece that we discussed. So one leg did unilateral leg extensions and unilateral leg press and just kept everything the same. So they did the exact same training program uh, over the course of the duration of the study, uh, over the course of eight weeks. Um, so basically one leg did the exact same workout for eight weeks. The other leg switched a bunch of variables up. Um, so they would have adjusted the load, they adjusted the rest periods, even adjusted the number of sets. And what they found was the exact same leg growth between both legs. Um, so it didn't make any difference if you switched things up a lot or if you kept it exactly the same. And that isn't really surprising to me. Um, we don't know exactly what it is that causes a muscle to grow, um, but we do know that progressive tension is really important. So you can keep everything the same as long as there's a progressive overloading stimulus in place, then the muscle will grow. And it doesn't really seem to matter if you're switching all these variables up. Now, by the same token, it also doesn't matter if you do prefer to vary things more frequently. Uh, for example, I find training gets boring if I just keep all the exercises and all the reps and everything the same all the time. Even though it might be good for progressive overload, this study shows that it also doesn't matter if you switch things up more frequently. Um, as long as you can have some kind of progressive tension stimulus in place, it's okay to switch things in and out if that makes training more enjoyable for your specific personality type. Um, one caveat here I would say is that if you have been training with a sim like a very similar training style for a really long time, like with the exact same approach, introducing something novel is likely to elicit new hypertrophy. Uh, this was found in other research uh, from a group of power lifters who basically were doing like a lot of really heavy low rep work for a long period of time. Once they started throwing like 20 plus reps at them, they started to grow much better. Um, so I think this lends some support to the idea that you can block out your training over a longer time scale to focus on a specific adaptation in each block or doing something slightly different from block to block so that your attention is focused on the short term. You're not just constantly switching everything up, but over the long term, you start to vary things to continue driving progress forward. And I think that ultimately a lot of the research on periodization does come down to periodic alteration in training variables. Um, so I would vary things over a longer time scale, so say from training block to training block, rather than uh, from workout to workout. So ho hopefully that makes sense. I think that that data was, was pretty cool. I think this is the last thing we're gonna touch. Um, so, okay, sodium bicarbonate supplementation. Don't know if you guys have heard much about it. Um, actually might have some legitimacy. So sodium bicarb is just baking soda. And the basic idea is that if you supplement it because it's so chemically basic, it'll help buffer the acid buildup that you see in muscle as it starts to fatigue and accumulate uh, metabolic byproducts. Um, so in this study here, which was a, a systematic review of 35 studies, found that 66% of the studies, which is pretty good, uh, showed some performance improvement from sodium bicarbonate. However, it's mostly been used in endurance contexts, so only one of those studies was on resistance training. Um, in the piece, uh, Dr. Zordos concludes that to benefit from baking soda supplementation, it seems that high volume training sessions with short intervals are necessary. Um, so if you have a really high volume block of training with really high rep stuff, for example, or even a single workout, um, it might not be a bad idea to supplement with baking soda and that might uh, improve your time to fatigue um, and maybe the, the volume for that session. However, a big caveat here is that it does tend to cause a lot of gastrointestinal distress, as you'd imagine, especially at the recommended dose. Um, so down here at the bottom, he recommends 
uh, a 0.3 milligram per kilogram dose. Um, so if you are going to try it, uh, he suggests splitting that up into three separate doses. And even if you do that, it might not be a bad idea to do it on a non-training day first, just to see how you respond to it. Definitely wouldn't put it in the same category as creatine or caffeine or even whey protein, in my opinion. Um, but it could have uh, some merit taken 60 minutes uh, prior to training um, in terms of buffering those protons from that muscle fatigue. So there's that. Oh, and then there's this piece on intermittent fasting. So I'm not going to go into any detail about this. I thought it was really great though. Um, I've done another video on intermittent fasting. Personally, I'm not a big fan of intermittent fasting as a way to maximize the anabolic response to feeding over a 24 hour period. I think there is enough mechanistic research to suggest that splitting your meat, your protein intake out more evenly is probably a more optimal way to split it up. Uh, but still, there are so many examples now of people in the real world who practice intermittent fasting and who are really jacked. Like it doesn't seem to be holding them back in any way. Uh, but what I would say is if you are going to use intermittent fasting, I would try to keep that eating window from getting too confined. Um, so here, uh, Eric suggests uh, feeding with an eight hour eating window is a suitable strategy for lifters and he says there's no adverse effects as long as total daily protein intake is high enough and training occurs in the fed state. If you're going to do intermittent fasting, since it can be a useful tool for adherence, you can um, reduce hunger and people find it's just a way for them to eat that's more convenient. It seems to be okay, uh, but I would try to keep that feeding window a little bit more open. Try to train in the fed state, pay a little bit more attention to your peri-workout nutrition, and definitely make sure that your total daily protein intake is high enough. Okay, and then the last article I told you guys, there's a lot of <laughs> information per issue. Um, so this last, last article was one that I covered in my effective reps video very briefly on growing more by avoiding failure. Uh, so this was another study that kind of uh, lends credence to the idea of using RPE. Um, to manage your fatigue as going to failure all the time does actually seem to inhibit growth, at least uh, according to this study. Um, so if you guys want to have a read through that, um, I'll have the link to mass uh, down below if you guys would like to subscribe. Um, and I think I'm going to leave it there for this one. Uh, mass is running a two-day sale today and tomorrow. So they'll do this for the first two days of every month. If you guys would like to check it out, uh, I'll have that link down below. And if you guys decide that you're going to subscribe later in the month or next month or what have you, make sure you go through jeffnipper.com, go over to the affiliate tab and then click the mass link uh, over there. That way you can support me and the work I'm doing here on the channel while taking your knowledge game up a couple of notches. Um, so that's it for this one, guys. Uh, thank you so much for watching. If you made it this far, don't forget to leave me a thumbs up. Subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you guys all here in the next one.